everyone! Welcome to another talk with Andy and Randy. I'm Andy. And I'm Randy, and we're glad you chose to check in with us today. Randy, this has been a very unusual month for May, hasn't it? It has, Andrew. We were teased in April with a week or so of beautiful sunshine and temperatures in the teens, but it hasn't translated into a warmer May yet. No, not at all. I mean, to see snow on Mother's Day weekend was not what any of us were hoping for. No. I remember one Mother's Day in Fort Erie when we had eight inches of lake effect snow. Wow. I know there were some areas north of Waterloo Region that got multiple inches this Mother's Day, but at least it's starting to warm up. You know, that's right, Andrew. I think it's one of the things we all look forward to. Coming of spring, gradual warming into summer, being able to get outside and, and do some of our favorite activities in the sun. I'm looking forward to losing coats and hats and being able to put on shorts, t-shirts, and flip-flops again. <laughs> flip-flops will be nice. We all need things to look forward to, to hope for, to hope in. I think that's something that's been hindered over the last couple of months with all the closures and COVID restrictions. Yeah, that's true. But as more businesses and shops are allowed to open up with social distancing protocols in place, people are beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. You know, a passage in the Bible that comes to mind when you mention that is about temptation in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13. You want to read that? Yeah, sure. Not a problem. If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Randy, that passage begins with a warning. It says that if we think we are standing firm, we should be careful or we might fall. Why do you think Paul would put that warning in here? Well, it's a little bit like some people with the coronavirus. If you think you can't get it or you won't get it somehow, that you're above it, you're more likely to do things that will put yourself in danger. It's called a novel or coronavirus because it had never been seen before. No one had any antibodies or immunity. Everyone had the potential to be infected, and depending on the strain, you could get very sick and even die. Yeah, that's right. And Paul has just finished giving multiple examples of God's people giving into temptation. The warning is against pride, complacency, or self-sufficiency. If we start thinking we are immune to temptation or won't be affected, we are more likely to put ourselves in situations where we'll be severely tested and are more likely to succumb to that temptation. I guess if we start feeling prideful or complacent, we've already started giving in to the temptation. That's true. Pride is a sin, so that would be giving in. It also says no temptation is overtaking you except what is common to mankind. Yeah, I noticed that. But surely there are new temptations in this world of computers that didn't exist in Paul's day. Well, there are, and there's new designer drugs and all kinds of different ways to sin. But the issues at the heart of temptation are the same. Will we do what we want or what God wants? Will we follow God's way or our own way? Will we do what seems right in the eyes of our friends, or will we do what God's Word tells us is the right thing? And even though there's new ways to sin, the underlying issues are the same. That makes a lot of sense. People have been consuming things that aren't good for them since Adam and Eve. People have been disobeying God's guidelines since the Garden of Eden. We need to stay humble and vigilant or we'll encounter unnecessary temptations and may fall very hard. Verse 13 tells us that God is faithful and will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. I find that quite comforting and reassuring. Me too, Andrew. It lets us know that even when we find ourselves on the verge of yielding to temptation, or when we have a strong urge to give in to an unhealthy or unwholesome desire, lust, or habit, God is limiting its intensity, its frequency, its pull on us, so we never are in a situation where we can't break free, where we can't win over the temptation. Are there many kinds of temptations in the world? Yeah, all kinds of them, aren't there? Yeah. So uh, what are some that come to your mind? Well, uh, sometimes people get tempted to do drugs or to get drunk or view impure or unholy things. Other times the temptation is to lose patience or temper or to gossip or to overindulge on things like chocolate or chips. Or chocolate chips. Yeah, or video games or movies or social media or any number of things. When people struggle with those things and give in over and over, it can seem like there's no hope. Like they'll never get the victory over that area or have it in their life. When people are beginning to feel that way, it's another temptation. The temptation to give in to despair or to stop trying. People sometimes acquiesce and believe, oh, that's just who I am or how I am. They accept that they can't change. 
The passage you read said, God will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear, but will give us or provide for us a way out. That's where the link came in for me to the light at the end of the tunnel. When you're trapped in a tunnel or a cave, if you can see some light, you have hope. And that's the idea of this passage. You and I will never be in a situation without hope. Never have to choose a sinful path. God will always give us an opening or an alternative if we're looking for it. I and mean, I think that's a very important concept. If we're looking for it, we can find the way out or the escape plan that God intended for us. Too often, we're so focused on satisfying our desires or experiencing momentary pleasures without any regard to the longer-term consequences of our choice or actions. When I lash out at others or say something insensitive or unkind, maybe hurtful even, to a family member or friend or coworker, it might ease my anger or make me feel better for a moment, but it always has a boomerang effect. In the end, it damages my relationships. And other temptations may seem to only hurt us, but that affects how we relate to others and it damages those relationships too. We really need to be on the lookout for the way out every time we sense that we're being tempted. We sure do. It makes me think of being in one of those escape rooms, you know, where they lock you in and you have to find the clues in order to get out. And sometimes you have to work really hard. It's hardly ever obvious. You have to search. You have to want it. But we need to be persistent like that and prayerful too. Not just looking for the way out, but looking for God's help. Asking Him to come alongside and guide us so that we can find the way out. And in those escape rooms, Escape rooms, sorry. It always helps to have someone else or even multiple friends with you. Alcoholics Anonymous and other recovery groups encourage people to call their sponsors or a supportive friend when the temptation is getting intense and they feel strongly pulled to give in. Andrew, I was thinking of that old show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, which is back on again. And in that show, they gave people three lifelines. One of them was called Phone a Friend, kind of like you're talking about. Yeah, when we're faced with temptation, especially when we feel pulled to give in, phoning or texting or connecting with a friend can be a true lifeline. Especially if we've already confided with them. If they know that we struggle in that area, they can help us redirect and talk us through the situation. Help us refocus and find a better solution or alternative. But what about in situations where we don't have that option, where our friends aren't accessible, they're busy, they're, they're not answering their phones because they're doing something else? Are there any other strategies we can employ to help us get out of that temptation? Well, I, I think about Joseph, and uh, you remember the guy with the coat of many colors? Uh, when he was a servant in Potiphar's house, his boss's wife was trying to seduce him. At first, his strategy was to give her good reason responses for why that wasn't a good idea. When she persisted, then he started avoiding her. It was a big enough house and yard and grounds that, that he could do that. But then one day he ended up in the same place and she grabbed him by the cloak and he refused to sleep with her. And she refused to let go until he did. So he left the cloak behind and ran out of the house. He fled completely. So sometimes the way out is a strong reason or argument. Sometimes avoiding a person or a place, and sometimes simply fleeing from the temptation of a person who is causing the temptation. One way or another, we need to find the way out or the way of escape. Randy, is temptation always just a physical thing? No, not at all. There are many layers to temptation. I'm sure you know that too. The emotional side of it, the social side of it, there's a physiological side to tem some temptations, psychological and spiritual components too. So there are some temptations that are more powerful because we've de developed a dependency on one of those areas, on a substance or a person or a feeling, kind of like an adrenaline rush. Oh, there's a lot of adrenaline junkies out there. Why do you think people are driving 300 kilometers an hour down the expressway? Yeah, that's, that's definitely an adrenaline rush. <laughs> Though, maybe they're in a hurry. <laughs> Temptations linked to habits and addictions are much tougher. They may need medical or other professional intervention or help. But in most cases, people will be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel and overcome temptation with God's help and the help of a friend. The spiritual component is significant too. Every time we give in to temptation, we give the enemy of our soul, Satan, the legal right to have a foothold in our lives, to mess with us. Church Renewal talks about that like letting a fly or a mosquito into the house. As you know, they don't stay in the room where you let them in. They mess up whatever they can. We need to realize that every sin matters. It has consequences that are further reaching than we can imagine. 
We need to be consistent in avoiding and resisting temptation, attempting to live a holy life with the help of the Holy Spirit. And when we realize we've fallen or failed or given in to temptation, we can't wallow in it like a pig in the mud. We need to immediately confess our sin by name, pride, jealousy, anger, or whatever it is, and repent of it by name. We need to, in Jesus' name, verbally break any spiritually ties and cast away any evil spirits who are granted access to us or our families because of our sin, naming it yet again. Yeah, we've mentioned that before in the talks we did about freedom a couple weeks back. You might want to look back and see those on our channel video section and uh, find the ones about freedom and getting spiritually free. Here's how a prayer like that might sound. Lord, I confess my sin of impatience with these COVID restrictions. I repent of my sin of impatience. And in Jesus' name, I break all spiritual ties to the sin of impatience and cast away any evil spirits that have access to me or my family because of my sin of impatience. Lord, fill me anew with your spirit and, and empower me to respond with patience the next time when I'm tempted to lose patience. Thanks, Randy. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. If you have questions or comments or you want to contact us, you can find our info on roseville.ub.ca. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye.